Hey, everybody. Come on up and sit down, please. <laughs> Hurry up. I've got to cover all the anti-lean ecosystems in the world and 40 years of research in my life in 12 minutes. <laughs> Is that cool? Yeah, sure. yes, ah, okay, okay. Hope everybody can hear me. So, I've got a lot to do. One of the things I wanted to do right off the bat is I want to recognize the people uh, that I've worked with over the many years that I've been doing this work. So, I have a number of direct students and colleagues that I consider my academic children. But also here, I've got uh, a number of people, some of them I met just for the first time, that are students of my former students, so my academic grandchildren. <laughs> and so I'd like to ask uh, those people to raise their hand and uh, uh, give a little record of recognition. Come on, Brad. Raise your hand. Yay. So um, what we're going to do here is I've been fortunate to uh, be able to be featured in a wide variety of uh, magazines. At the end, I'll show you some TV documentaries I've been in. And uh, I want to get the word out to people everywhere around the world about the importance of anti-lean ecosystems. So, objectives of my talk today, I'm going to cover the three E's. I want to educate, entertain, and enthuse you. So those are the three things you've got to do. Um, I'm going to use the KISS principle. I'm going to keep it simple, okay? So we're going to go down to lower the grade level on this because I got a lot to do. There's three parts to any presentation. You got to tell them what you're going to tell them. Then you gotta tell them, and then you gotta tell them what you told them. Okay? So those are the three parts. So we're gonna start off with the first part. What I'm gonna tell you. So I'm gonna tell you a couple things. So we've got a lot of young people here. I'm gonna tell you the secret of getting a job in science. Second thing, I'm gonna tell you the secret to succeeding in science. And finally, I'm going to tell you why anti-lean ecosystems are the most important ecosystems on the planet. <laughs> How many of you have been asked, you know, why are you studying these little shrimp in these little tiny ponds? <laughs> what the hell does it matter? Okay? I'm going to tell you what it matters. <laughs> so pay attention, please. So, the beginning. We're going to start with me and where I started and how I got into this field. So I have academic degrees in BS in biochemistry, master's in oceanography, and PhD in biochemistry from a medical school, no less. So the only things that really counted eventually was I had a degree in oceanography and I had a PhD. It didn't matter what the field was that the PhD was in, it just happened to be some sort of PhD. When I was in college, the one course that was really changed my life around and got me on the track where I am today was a course uh, in my master's program that was called Environments of Marine Deposition. And it involved a two-week scuba diving cruise to tongue the ocean in the Bahamas. So let me see here, there we go. Okay, so this is Andros Island in the Bahamas, and this dark water is the, called the tongue of the ocean. So the little blue edge here is waters that are about 90 feet deep. Take one step off, and you go into this dark blue water, it's 6,000 feet deep. So it's a huge cliff. And you can imagine this during the ice ages, when the sea level was down 350 feet or so, man, you'd come up to this place and it would be just surrounded by enormous cliffs. There'd be no way you'd get to the top of this big flat plateau that's shallow water today. So it's a really cool place, 
It influenced me to having the chance to go scuba diving in a place that uh, very few people get to was fantastic. So my hobbies were very important to me. They ended up probably being more important than anything else I've ever done. So when I lived in Florida, my hobby was scuba diving. And this is one of the sites I went scuba diving. This is called the Devil's Eye. That's a cool name, Devil's Eye. And there's a cave down at the bottom, and it's a really beautiful site. So we go out here and we camp over the weekend, go diving, have a great time. But then I moved over to Texas, and in Texas there's really not much good places to dive. So I got involved in exploring caves. And I went in caves in the hill country of central Texas, and then some friends invited me to go on trips where we drive down all across the border and go into northern Mexico and there's fantastic caves in the mountains. Most of them are vertical caves, so you need ropes to descend down into them. But that was what I did and that was what I was excited in doing. So then I got my first job. My first job was a research associate at the Bermuda Biological Station, and I was hired to do research on tar washing up on the beaches there. So how did the hell did I ever get this job? Well, I was graduating soon, getting my PhD. I was looking around, and I saw this ad in Science, the back of Science Magazine, saying, hey, Here's a job in Bermuda. I said, way cool, I don't want to go. <laughs> and so I wrote in an application, I sent it in, and I learned later there was more than 100 other people who applied for that job. So, but the person who was reviewing the applications happened to have read the paper that I wrote as a result of my master's degree. So he recognized my name, and my application went to the top of the pile. So he calls me up and he said, hey Tom, we'd like to uh, interview you for the position. And I think, wow, I'm gonna get a chance to go to Bermuda at least. And then he says, well, I'm coming to the States next week. I'll come down to Texas and meet up with you. So, well, that wasn't quite so good, but it turned out to be the best thing ever because as soon as he got to Texas, my major professor and I took him out to an Italian restaurant where we had bottle after bottle after bottle of wine. We got him really soused and drunk, and he offered me the job. <laughs> There's your secret on how to get a job, okay? You gotta be in control of the reviewer, the interviewer, not let them be in control of you. You're the boss, take over. Okay, so I went to Bermuda, and Bermuda is this little tiny island way out the Atlantic, 600 miles off the coast of the United States. Here's what it looks like. Mark Twain described saying it looked like a fish hook, only smaller. So, this island is uh, basically all limestone, and uh, it sits atop a volcanic seamount. So this is all volcanic eruptions long, long, long ago, 35 million years ago, this was formed. Today, um, it's all dormant, but it's all limestone on top. You, there's nowhere you can go and you can see the volcanic rocks. In the limestone, there's numerous caves. And I found out that there was more than 100 caves that were within a 10 minute ride or 15 minute ride from my house. So I got lots of places to go. When I went into these caves, because these caves are all close to the ocean, there's water that comes into them, tidal pools go up and down, crystal clear water, and you can look down in this crystal clear water and you can see tunnels going off. And um, so I said, gee, I've got to go diving here. This is the only way to explore. I'm a, but I need to learn how, so I got a, uh, in touch with a colleague, a friend of mine from Florida, and invited him to come and live with us in my house for a couple of weeks, 
and it'll teach me to cave dive. So this is the my first C card, uh, 19, 1979 up here was my certification date as a cave diver. So that's the next step is becoming a cave diver. And we began diving in these caves. We found out, wow, they're fantastic. There's all sorts of really massive stalactites and stalagmites underwater. But stalactites and stalagmites are formed by dripping water. They can't form underwater. They can only form in air in dry caves. So these caves must have been dry and air-filled for a very, very, very long time. So if you take a look here, we've got a diver that's swimming between these two very massive columns underwater. How old are these? Well, it takes very roughly, very approximately 100 years to form one cubic inch. So how many cubic inches are in either one of these? Multiply by 100 years, and you've got a hell of a long time that this cave must have been dry. So the question is, to me, where were the cave animals living when this cave was dry and air-filled? And we'll try and answer that. So here's what it looks like. This is one of my favorite photos. Here you are, imagine you're swimming down this tunnel and you've got just going into the darkness ahead. Huge tunnels, beautiful setting, crystal clear water. You know, it couldn't be any better. So I really lucked out. Now, here's one of the first animals I found and it was a little tiny crustacean so I get this guy and I look at it and I show it to other people who are working there with me and nobody could identify it. And so they said, well, why don't you send it to the Smithsonian? So I sent it to Dr. Thomas Bowman, who is the leading, the world's <coughs> leading expert on crustacea. And I got a, um, a letter back from him um, 10 days or two weeks later. And he writes me and he says, Tom, I've never seen anything like this in my life. Pretty damn cool. When you can do that, that's one of the first things you ever do as a biologist. So here it became a new order. And we also had another new order. Here we did a nature paper on uh, biogeography in the caves of Bermuda, where there's large numbers of invertebrates. Uh, most of them are endemic species. Uh, they seem to come from many locations, from the Caribbean, living on sea mounts, uh, relic deep sea fauna, or Tethian relics. Uh, now, I want to correct a misconception. We did have a conference before we started numbering them. This was called the Bermuda Cave Symposium. We didn't have called Anculene because there wasn't any such thing until this conference occurred. And we came out with a paper that created the concept of including Anculene caves as part of Anculene ecosystems. And later we went to the Canary Islands and we found a, a fantastic fauna there and we had a science paper resulting from that. Um, Next thing is, I wonder, we know it's great in the Atlantic, let's see what's in the Pacific. We did a year-long trip across the South Pacific, uh, covering many, many different islands, staying about a month in each of these sites. Uh, one of the places we went in the South Pacific was the island of Hawaii, and we wanted to find a place to go cave diving. So, we found a site that was down near the south point of the island, and here we have this pool. Most of you just see this pool and nothing else, 
but if you drop down, you come into this fantastic lava tube tunnel that's going off. It's small, tight in places, and then opens up into huge rooms. It's a really spectacular submerged lava tube cave, and there's a lot of interesting biology in it. Uh, we described a new genus from the cave and a new species that may or may, may not be uh, something different. We decided to go into some new technology, a rebreather, and the one thing about rebreathers is they have a little uh, disclaimer, this machine will try to kill you, your job is to keep it from doing that. And we uh, did a project in Bermuda where we were looking for deep water caves. Uh, we did some high resolution sonar scans uh, looking at the edge of Bermuda between 200 and 600 feet. And we found all sorts of holes. We found a cave at 60 meters and a wave cut notch at 115 meters. Uh, we did a lot of collaborative research on a variety of topics. I'm running out of time, so I'll go quickly. Uh, we discovered lots of new taxa, uh, large numbers from uh, Bahamas and Bermuda, Yucatan, Philippines, etc. Uh, discovered more than 300 new taxa, uh, three new orders, 13 new families, 69 new genera, 218 new species and counting. Uh, so a lot of these were from widely dispersed places around the world. So um, I just had a paper came out that I was co uh, cooperating on. So we talked about realms, one of five major components of the biosphere. The five components are terrestrial, freshwater, marine, subterranean, atmospheric. So there's one ecosystem that has all five of those as components of it. It's a place called Anculene Ecosystems, and it's right here in the exact center of all the ecosystems on the planet. That's pretty damn cool. <laughs> you better be impressed by that. So anybody asks you why you study Anculene Ecosystems, it's the centermost ecosystem on the entire planet. Everything else revolves around it. <laughs> I got carried away. So, I'm sorry. I get excited. So, this, uh, oh, here, let me do this one real quick. So, I must admit, I've got a a weakness, can you put that in? Yeah, I collect monkey pictures. <laughs> so, uh, I'm, there's a new book coming out in uh, a few weeks. Uh, it's gonna be by a 10 times best-selling author, uh, Neil Strauss, and uh, it's features, it's called Bored and Dangerous, so don't get me uh, uh, bored. I might get dangerous. I have a uh, monkey that's in the book, and he's the lead character, one of the lead characters in the book. The first sentences in the book say the stories of Dark Mass, the mutant, or Legion. Their veracity is unclear, but assume at least there's a kernel of truth in each of them. Well, that may apply to me, too. Um, and if you want to find out more, here's some uh, reading assignments and a couple of TV documentaries that you might want to look up. Okay, I'll leave, if you want to take a, a picture of that, you can get, uh, uh, look that up. <laughs>